It's 6 p.m. on a Friday here in Korea. Welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let's begin with the headlines. Early voting for the April 13th general election begins in more than 3,500 polling stations across the nation. This has proven to be a game changer in tightly contested districts with more younger voters turning up. It's business as usual for President Bakane. Straight after returning from her first overseas trip of the year, on Friday she continued monitoring progress in providing greater support for startups by visiting two regional innovation centers. The effectiveness of the latest sanctions on Pyongyang designed to cut off the source of hard currency to the regime is made clearly visible, with 13 North Koreans working at an overseas North Korean restaurant defecting to South Korea. We begin with early voting for people unable to vote on the actual election day on April 13th. Our Kim Ji-yeon is at one of the thousands of polling stations across the nations. This one is at the nation's main gateway, Incheon International Airport. Ji-yeon, how's the turnout so far? Well, I've been here around the clock today, and I noticed that around 10 to 30 people were waiting in line to vote. And I talked to some of them. Take a look. I might not have the time to vote on election day because I'm working, so I'm relieved I had the chance to cast my ballot at an early voting station. I was going to cast my ballot at home before I left for vacation, but I heard that I could vote here, so that's what I did. The National Election Commission first adopted the system during the April by-election in 2013 as part of efforts to boost voter turnout rate. And it's the first time ever the country has set up a polling station at Incheon International Airport, where 45 million people fly in or out of Korea every year. The reason early voting is important is because it could prove to be a game-changer in tightly contested districts and also attract more younger voters in the 20-somethings to take part, similar to what happened at the local elections back in 2014. As of 5 p.m., more than 2 million people, nearly 5 percent of the total number of voters, have cast their ballots at one of the 3,511 polling stations. The highest early voter turnout was in the country's Tolanamdo region, while the lowest number of voters was in Busan. Well, Jian, other than being out there to file us this report, I believe you made a difference today. You cast your ballot at the polling station as well. For those that are in a hurry mm -hmm. but still want to but, vote yeah. tomorrow, can you give us some tips, Jian? Well, sure. Well, I recommend if you have a choice to come during the afternoon from 1 to 4 p.m. rather than in the morning. Also, there's a special line for Incheon's Chungu residents here, so that could save you some time because the line is shorter. Remember to bring your resident registration or driver's license to save time. It's faster than showing your passport. But even if you don't reside in this area or choose to show your passport, from my experience, it generally takes less than 20 minutes to vote. So I highly encourage those who haven't had the chance to cast their ballots if you pass one of the voting stations on Saturday. All right, thank you for being out there for us, and thank you for those valuable tips, Jian. Moving on, when Koreans head to polls on April 13th, they will get two ballots, one for district representative and another for a party. The latter will determine how many proportional representatives each party will get in the National Assembly. Shin se has a breakdown of how things are looking for the parties this year. A total of 300 lawmakers will be elected, with 253 of them selected through constituency elections and the remaining 47 allocated through proportional representation. Proportional representatives are awarded to the parties based on the number of votes they get. But to be eligible, a party has to get more than 3 percent of the vote, where more than five of its candidates have to be elected. This year, there are 21 parties running, resulting in one of the longest ballots ever printed. The 158 candidates in contention for proportional representative seats generally have not held office before, but come from a wide variety of backgrounds and reflect a party's vision. They have been nominated and ranked by the party with the higher numbers given priority once the number of seats has been determined. The ruling Senate party currently has the most proportional representatives, with 27, and the main opposition Minju Party of Korea has 20. 
And the previously collected polling data shows that those numbers aren't likely to change much after the upcoming election. Polling company RealMeter made some predictions of how many proportional representatives each party will get based on the party's approval ratings in the week of March 28th to 30th. Its projections show the ruling Tenuri Party garnering 20 seats based on its approval rating of 37.7 percent, the Minja Party getting 14 with its 25.2 percent approval rating, the People's Party getting 8, and the Justice Party 5. A similar survey done by Gallup based on ratings from March 29th to 31st projects a similar outcome, with Senori Party taking 23 seats, the Minja Party getting 13, the People's Party 8, and the Justice Party 3. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. After a recent trip to North America, President Bakane got back to the task of revitalizing the nation's economy. She traveled outside the capital to two regional innovation centers. Song Jisan has more on the president's follow-up on progress they made over the past year. Continuing her checkup on recently established creative economy innovation centers, the president visited the branch in Korea's central Chungcheongbuk-do province, a center which specializes in the bio and beauty sectors. In addition to hearing about the center's progress over the past year, President Buck also attended the launch of employment zones at the center, which opened in all 17 innovation centers as of the end of last month. It's anticipated that the recruiting centers will create 2,500 new jobs by matching job seekers with startups in the innovation centers and provide training programs for 10,000 employees. She then visited the Cholabukta branch, specializing in agriculture and carbon fiber. The two centers so far have supported the launch and production of over a hundred startups and small companies, respectively. Startups that were fostered at innovation centers are now expanding overseas, debuting at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona and sealing contracts at business events held during the president's latest visit to U.S. and Mexico. President Buck has encouraged participating companies to be ambitious and set their sights on the global market. Song Sun, Arirang News. South Korea and Norway are set to hold summit talks next week here in Seoul. The presidential office of Chang Wa announced that President Park Geun-hye will sit down with Norwegian Prime Minister Erna Solberg on April 15th during her four-day visit to Korea. This is the first time the two leaders will meet since they both took office in 2013. Norway is an important strategic partner in Seoul's shipbuilding and maritime affairs, with over half of Norway's ship orders won by Seoul last year and a key country in realizing Seoul's Eurasia initiative to link the continents. As a longtime ally, Oslo has also strongly advocated imposing and implementing sanctions on North Korea for its nuclear provocations. Thirteen North Koreans working overseas have escaped and defected to South Korea on Thursday. South Korea said Friday one male manager and 12 female employees have agreed to defect to the South. South's Unification Ministry did not reveal where this restaurant is located and what route they used to defect, considering diplomatic relations with other countries and the possible risk these defected North Koreans could be identified or tracked down. The ministry spokesman did say the escapees may have been influenced by South Korean culture. The North Korean employees have found out about the reality of South Korea through South Korean television, movies and internet, and how unrealistic North Korean propaganda is, so they have decided to defect as a group. The ministry said it has decided to accept all 13 defected North Koreans based on humanitarian grounds. This is the first time North Koreans defected as a group from the same restaurant overseas. More independent sanctions are expected to be imposed on North Korea for its violations against the international community. A French official revealed that Paris is also preparing ways to heap more pressure on the regime. Kwon Soa gives us the updates. While the international community works to implement the UN Security Council's unprecedented sanctions on North Korea for its nuclear and missile tests earlier this year, France is planning to impose its own additional restrictions against the regime, joining other countries like South Korea, the U.S., the U.K. and Japan. 
This according to Emmanuel Lunet, an official at France's foreign ministry who spoke with the joint press corps of Seoul's foreign ministry in Paris earlier this week. Lenin said France's unilateral sanctions would include expanding travel bans, economic and financial sanctions. He said they would be similar in nature to those imposed by the UN Security Council, in which France is one of the five permanent members, and the European Union, which the diplomat says is expected to further expand its blacklist. He went on to say that the measures are a result of the concerns the French government, along with the EU, has regarding North Korea's threats, and that having diplomatic relations with North Korea does not provide reason to impose extra sanctions. This as France has no diplomatic ties with North Korea, unlike the majority of EU members. Meanwhile, the officials stressed that six-party talks on denuclearization appear impossible as Pyongyang has given no indication of relenting from its provocative acts. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Some of the world's political elite continue to defend themselves over details of potentially illicit offshore accounts that were discovered in the world's biggest data leak ever, known as the Panama Papers. For the latest development resulting from the fallout, we turn to Kwon Jang-ho. After Iceland's Prime Minister stepped down on Tuesday, several other world leaders are finding themselves in an uncomfortable position after details of their offshore accounts emerged from the so-called Panama Papers leak. In Argentina, state prosecutors have asked a judge to open an investigation into President Mauricio Macri's involvement in offshore companies. I want to say to you all one more time that I am very calm, that I have complied with the law, I have told the truth and that I have nothing to hide. Over in the UK, Prime Minister David Cameron, after three days of probing questions by the press and the public, finally admitted that he had profited from his father's offshore trust. We owned uh, 5,000 units in Blairmore Investment Trust, which we sold in January uh, 2010. Was, was there a profit on it? I paid um, income tax on the dividends, um, but there was a profit on it, but it was less than the capital gains tax allowance, so I didn't pay capital gains tax, but it was subject to all the UK taxes in all the normal way. Meanwhile, Russia's President Vladimir Putin claimed that the accusations against him and his associates were a conspiracy to destabilize the country. And the Chinese government also took steps to censor all content regarding the Panama Papers from the Internet, after foreign press revealed several family members of the country's leadership were named in the documents. Some of the most powerful political figures in the world have been rattled, and it remains to be seen how many more will be shaken as more details emerge from the documents. Kwon Jang-ho, Arirang News. Turning our focus back to South Korea, in its monthly report on the national economy known as the Green Book, the government says the Korean economy seems to be slowly rebounding from a protracted slump as recent economic indicators point to signs of recovery. But will it be able to maintain this momentum? Kim Min-ji has the details. The Korean economy is showing signs of recovery. That's the assessment by the country's finance ministry, which says the economy is rebounding slowly from a slump earlier in the year. Recent data show that industrial output rose over 3 percent on month in February, marking the highest jump in over six years. This is mainly due to an uptick in demand for semiconductors as Korea's tech giants release new smartphones. Card spending, which indicate retail sales, also posted a double-digit growth rate. Transactions amounted to 45 billion U.S. dollars in February, which is up more than 12 percent on year. As for exports, the ministry noted that despite another fall in March, the pace of decline has significantly slowed. Outbound shipments slid over 8 percent last month after posting double-digit drops for the past three months. However, the finance ministry said that external risks such as a global economic slowdown could weigh on the local economy. The ministry vowed to carry out economic tasks, including structural reform and job creation, to facilitate solid economic recovery. But according to experts, it may be too early to say that the economy is rebounding. Data indicating recovery for one or two months is not enough to say that the rebound will continue. Improvement of external conditions is a prerequisite. However, that's not the case now, so it's too early to say whether the economy will improve or not.
Experts add that the government will also have to maintain its stimulus measures as a recent uptick in domestic demand was a result of such efforts. Kim min Arirang News. Korea's central bank has recently been under growing pressure to cut its key interest rate. This as a general election is on the horizon and the economy remains listless with little hope for a solid recovery anytime soon. Hwang Jie has this report. The current key rate of 1.5% is accommodative enough to support Korea's growth momentum. That's what Korea's top central banker Lee Ji-yeol has been emphasizing while expressing skepticism about the positive effects of a potential cut. Such remarks have calmed calls for Korea to join the easing frenzy that neighboring countries like China and Japan have been engaged in. But with the general election around the corner, pressure for more easing has returned. Late last month, the ruling Senori party announced an election pledge that demands the Bank of Korea start quantitative easing. It proposed the central bank buy bonds from state-run banks and purchase mortgage-backed securities. It's hard to say who is right or wrong, as the ruling party's proposal would have side effects. However, it's certainly an issue that policymakers should keep in mind, since Korea is seeing the limitations of its fiscal and key rate policies. The key concern is that a radical easing policy would cause a massive capital outflow because the local currency would lose value. Unlike Korea, experts say the U.S. and Japan that have already introduced quantitative easing are countries that hold key currencies. Switzerland and Norway were not able to lay out QE measures, although they're both advanced nations with a stable currency. That's because they also face uncertainties over exchange rate volatility and whether they're able to control it. Given such concerns coupled with the law guaranteeing the BOK's independence to said monetary policy, some say the ruling party's campaign pledge could not be enforced anyway. However, in light of an upcoming reshuffle of the monetary policy board, market analysts expect the BOK to turn more dovish. This means discussions over more easing are likely to be heated. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. That's all from us for now. As always, thank you for watching.